Hello students, welcome to the lecture on Consumer Protection Act and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Define the objectives of Consumer Protection Act. Explain Consumer Protection Council. Learning about rights of consumers. Understand the application of CPA. Let's start with the concept of Consumer Protection Act. Aim of Consumer Protection Act, CPA, is to address the grievances of the consumers and protecting them from the unethical practices, behavior or unfair trade practices of the manufacturer, supplier. Earlier though, there were several legislations to protect the consumer, but the same never proved adequate to protect consumer and compensate them for their compliances. CPA became statutory umbrella, which made the consumer feel like a king. CPA not only enhances the awareness and educate the consumer but also provide compensation to them by summary and inexpensive proceedings. This keeps manufacturer and the trader alert, creative and innovative. In the era of free competition, market has become very dynamic and margins have squeezes out. Let us now discuss the objectives of Consumer Protection Act. The basic objective purpose of this act is to provide for better protection of the interest of the consumers and for that purpose to make provisions for the establishment of consumer councils and other authorities for the settlement of consumers dispute and for matters connected therewith. 
Hence, the basic objective is to protect and not to provide a loophole and excuses to well-organized traders, producers and big business houses and manufacturers on technical grounds. Basic need for the Consumer Protection Act. Consumer rights are an integral part of our lives, like the consumerist way of life. We have all made use of them at some point in our daily lives. Market resources and influences are growing by the day and so is the awareness of one's consumer rights. So let us look at few reasons because of which consumer needs protection, illiteracy and ignorance. Consumers are mostly illiterate and ignorant. They do not understand their rights. A system is required to protect them from unscrupulous businessmen. Unorganized consumers. Consumers are widely dispersed and are not united. They are at the mercy of businessmen. On the other hand, producers and traders are organized and powerful. Spurious goods. There is increasing supply of duplicate products. It is very difficult for an ordinary consumer to distinguish between a genuine product and its imitation. Freedom of enterprise. Businessmen must ensure satisfaction of consumers. In the long run, survival and growth of business is not possible without the support and goodwill of consumers. If business does not protect consumers' interests, government intervention and regulatory measures will grow to curb unfair trade practices. Definitions of important terms of act goods. Goods means goods as defined in the Sale of Goods Act, 1930, Section 2, 7 of Sale of Goods Act, 1930. According to the Sale Service, Section 2, 1, 0, service means service of nay description which is made available to potential users and includes, but not limited to, the provision of facilities in connection with banking, financing, insurance, transport, processing, supply of electrical or other energy, boarding or lodging or both housing construction, entertainment, amusement or the purveying of news or other information but does not include the rendering of any service free of charge or under a contract of personal service. Defect Section 2 1. Defect means any fault, imperfection or shortcoming in the quality, quantity, potency, purity or standard which is required to be maintained by or under any law for the time being in force or under any contract express or implied or as is claimed by the trader in any manner whatsoever in relation to any goods. Consumer dispute section 2.1c means a dispute where a person against whom a complaint has been made denies or disputes the allegations contained in the complaint. Well, I get a lot of questions uh, these days about the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, which has taken a uh, uh, more preeminent uh, role in, in American business because of the impact that it's having on uh, not only call center and collection type businesses, but also creditors and any company that's engaged in sales and marketing activities with using a telephone. Um, the, the crux of the act was to regulate telemarketing uh, about 20 years ago, but as time has gone on, there's a provision within what we call the TCPA that regulates any use of an automatic dialer to call cellular telephones. And as cellular telephones have emerged as uh, the most prominent communication tool, or, and, and soon will probably uh, pass landlines as people's most uh, common uh, telephone, the implications of the TCPA have become bigger and bigger. The TCPA prohibits the use of automatic dialers to call cellular telephones unless you have uh, prior express consent. And what has happened over the last few years is that courts have taken the definition of an automatic dialer and expanded the uh, statutory language so that it includes telephone dialing technology even if it's used in a manual type mode, if it has the capacity to store and randomly and sequentially dial numbers, it's governed by the act. So this creates a problem for a lot of businesses that use dialer technology even in a manual mode to make phone calls because all of those calls are then governed by the act. The Federal Communications Commission has 
uh, from time to time issued guidance and different opinions about uh, what the TCPA means and with respect to um, prior express consent they have essentially uh, said that they view it as uh, a consumer providing their phone number at the time they create an account or have an initial interaction with a company that that creates consent that they could be called under the TCPA. Uh, however, uh, phone numbers that are obtained from third-party sources or that come into a, a company system by other means clearly do not meet that definition, so it's very important that companies be able to differentiate the numbers for which they have consent and the ones that they do not. Uh, one of the most recent turn of events has been a case out of the Seventh Circuit in Illinois where a uh, company was dialing or calling a number for which they had consent, but as it turned out, uh, since the time they had obtained that number, the cell phone service had switched to a new subscriber. So the issue in the case became whether or not it, you know, they violated the TCPA when they had consent to call the original subscriber, but now it was a different subscriber. And unfortunately, uh, the court ruled that the uh, definition referencing quote-unquote called party had to do with the person that actually receives the call, not who the caller intended to call. And so this is throwing a little bit of a wrinkle into the consent area because the, um, the creditors now have to not only know whether they have consent on their phone numbers initially, but at the time those numbers are dialed, it puts an onus on the caller to determine is that subscriber still the same as it was maybe three or five years ago. The reason that the TCPA has become such a hot topic and, and the litigation has really started to mushroom is because the damages provision under the TCPA is much more uh, arcane and, and uh, difficult than it is in a lot of consumer protection statutes. The damages are uh, for a violation are uh, $500 per call or it can be trebled up to $1,500 if it's a willful or knowing violation. And so when you start to extrapolate that over a period of four years, which is the statute of limitations, and you think about the number of calls that you can make on an automated dialer over a period of four years, often the potential damages in one of these cases is in the... Now moving on to the next topic, we will study the Consumer Protection Council. The interests of the consumers are sought to be promoted and protected under the Act inter allies by establishment of consumers' protection councils at the central and state levels. So the Consumer Protection Act 1986 comprising Section 4 to Section 6 deals with consumers' protection councils, functions, duties and powers of the council. The functions, duties and powers of the council shall be as follows to offer suggestions to Government of Nepal on matters relating to the protection of the rights and interests of consumers, the supply system and prices, quality and purity of consumer goods and services, to disseminate information relating to the rights and interests of consumers in order to inform them about the standard of goods and services so as to protect them in matters concerned consumer goods and services. To inform consumers about the prices, quality, quantity and purity of consumer goods and services as well as about unfair trading practices concerning them or make arrangements for doing so. To conduct studies in connection with the protection of the rights and interests of consumers or make arrangements for doing so. Central Consumers Protection Council Section 4 empowers the central government to establish a council to be known as the Central Consumer Protection Council consisting of Minister in Charge of Consumers Affairs in the central government as its chairman and such number of other officials or non-official members representing such its chairman and such number of other officials or non-officials member representing such interest as may be prescribed. State Consumers Protection Council Section 4 provides for the establishment by notification to be known as Consumers Protection Council for name of the state. The state council shall consist of a minister in charge of consumers affairs in the state government and its chairman and such number of other officials or non-officials members representing such interest as may be prescribed by the state government. District Consumer Protection Council Section 8 
A provides for the establishment by notification for every district a council to be known as distinct consumer protection council consisting of a collector of the district who will be the chairman and number of other officials and non-official members representing such interests. Redressal machinery under the Act. The Act provides for a three-tier quasi judicial redressal machinery at the district, state and national level to redressal of consumers dispute and grievances. The district from, from has jurisdiction to entertain complaint where the value of goods, services complained against and the compensation. Jurisdiction of consumer forums. The provisions regarding jurisdiction of various consumer dispute redressal forums and their jurisdiction may be summarized as follows. District Forum. Pecuniary Jurisdiction Section 11.1 of CPA deals with pecuniary jurisdiction. It provides that the district forum has the jurisdiction to entertain complaints where the value of the goods or services and the compensation if any claimed does not exceed $40,000. State Commission Original Jurisdiction under Section 17A of CPA the State Commission can entertain complaints where the value of the goods or services and compensation, if any, claimed exceed 20 lakhs of rupees but does not exceed rupees 1 crore, the matter can be heard by the State Commission. Revisional Jurisdiction The jurisdiction of the National Commission in Revision has been laid down in Section 21B of CPA. This is limited to consumer disputes wherein a state commission has exercised a jurisdiction not vested in it by law or has failed to exercise jurisdiction so vested or has acted in the exercise of its jurisdiction illegally or with material irregularity. Appeal to Supreme Court under Section 23. Any person aggrieved by an order made by the National Commission in exercise of its powers conferred by subclause of Clause A of Section 21 may prefer an appeal against such order to the Supreme Court within a period of 30 days from the date of order, provided that the Supreme Court may entertain an appeal after the expiry of the period of 30 days if it is satisfied that there was sufficient cause for not filling it within that period. Let's know the rights of consumers. Consumer law establishes consumer rights or buyers' rights generally by providing a product warranty or other consumer guarantees. Consumer rights vary by jurisdiction. In addition to a warranty, consumer protection efforts may include the establishment of a governmental body that monitors the market and provides the consumer with some remedies to correct bad sales practices. A statutory product warranty, which is a law that re requires manufacturers to warrant that their products are fit for consumer use is a significant consumer right. Other laws permit consumers to cancel a contract and obtain a full refund while some jurisdictions give consumers the right to sue for damages. Without government interference, the law of the marketplace has historically been caveat emptor or let the buyer beware. Unfortunately, this principle permits unscrupulous businesses to devastate the individual consumer. In 1962, U.S. President John F. Kennedy signed the Consumer Bill of Rights, the first of its kind. Since then, increasing consumer rights have been added by statute and by proclamation both in the United States and internationally. These consumer rights guarantee choice, safety and notice, among other rights. The Consumer Product Safety Commission CPSC is another U.S. government agency dedicated to the preservation of consumer rights. The CPSC is charged with protecting client safety and has the ability to investigate and recall a huge range of products. Each U.S. state also has its own consumer protection laws. These laws cover such areas as establishing a warranty for a product, setting a maximum interest rate, providing penalties for deceptive sales practices and establishing remedies for lemon automobiles. Some states have an agency similar to the FTC that protects consumer rights. Other states protect consumer rights through another agency or office such as the Attorney General. 
Buying electrical goods can throw up all kinds of problems. It's hard enough trying to work out your RAM from your ROM without knowing what to do when things go wrong. It's supposed to be an HD ready TV, but the only thing it's ready for is the bin. The ad said your computer plays DVDs, but it only takes CDs. And you weren't expecting your brand new washing machine to let more water out than in. Well, here's some good news. You may have parted with your hard-earned cash, but as soon as you've entered into a contract with the seller, you have rights. The Sale of Goods Act states that any item you buy from a trader, someone selling goods as a business, such as a shop or online shop, must be of satisfactory quality, fit for purpose, and as described. If it isn't, the item is faulty, and you should contact the trader as soon as possible because you can usually get a repair, replacement or refund. Next time you buy any type of electrical goods, check it over properly as soon as you get home. Make sure you followed any installation or operating rules correctly. Don't try and repair it yourself and check the manufacturer's warranty or your home insurance to see if you're covered because they may provide additional legal rights on top of the ones you already have under the contract with the seller. If you do buy an extended warranty, always shop around for the best price. And remember, you already have statutory rights if things go wrong. Either way, make sure you know your legal rights so you can have confidence when you buy. The main rights of consumers are right to safety. A consumer has the right to safety against such goods and services as are hazardous to his health, life and property. Right to be informed, right to representation. A consumer has also the right that he should be provided with all the information on the basis of which he decides to buy goods or services. Such information relate to quality, purity, potency, standard, date of manufacture, method of use, etc. of the commodity. Right to choose. A consumer has absolute right to buy any goods or services of his choice from among the different goods or services available in the market. In other words, no seller can influence his choice in an unfair manner. If any seller does so, it will be deemed as interference in his right to choice. Right to be heard. A consumer has the right that his complaint be heard. Under this right, the consumer can file a complaint against all those things which are prejudicial to his interest. Right to basic needs. The basic needs means those goods and services which are necessary for a dignified living of people. It includes adequate food, clothing, shelter, energy, sanitation, health care, education and transportation. All the consumers have the right to fulfill these basic needs. When you shop, you are protected by the Australian Consumer Law. When you shop, it is your right to ask questions. For example, what are the phone's features and how does it work? Take your time when you shop. Don't be rushed into signing any paperwork. It's your right to ask for a receipt as proof of your purchase when you buy goods. If the goods you buy don't work, or are faulty, you can take them back to the seller with your receipt. If the fault is major, you choose which option you want. If the fault is minor, the trader chooses. If you damage the goods, oh. you may not be entitled to a repair, replacement or refund. Goods bought from a shop, either new or used, come with a consumer guarantee. This means that goods will work and do what they are supposed to do. If you buy goods privately from a garage sale, online auction, from friends or within your community, there are no guarantees. The guarantee covers you if the goods you buy 
don't match the description or are faulty. Mm. They can be replaced or refunded. Sometimes goods you buy come with a warranty. This is a voluntary promise made by the seller or manufacturer to fix the goods if something goes wrong. Sellers may sell you an extended warranty. Remember, most goods are already covered by a consumer guarantee and warranty. Keep the receipt and warranty in a safe place. Mm -hmm. They are your proof of purchase if something goes wrong. Application of the CPA. Goods or services promoted or supplied to the state. Where the consumer is a juristic person whose annual turnover or asset value exceeds or equals a determined financial threshold. The threshold has since been determined to be Rs 2 million. If the transaction has been exempted in terms of Section 5.3 and Section 5.4. If the transaction constitutes a credit agreement in terms of the National Credit Act. Employment contracts. Transactions giving effect to collective bargaining agreements in terms of the Labor Relations Act 66 of 1995. During the drafting stages of the CPA sentiment was that any transaction that relates to a credit agreement as defined in the National Credit Act would be fully exempted from the application of the CPA. However, this is not the case. The CPA shall also apply to the actual goods or services that are the subject of a credit agreement. In terms of Section 5.3, a regulatory authority may apply to the Minister for an industry-wide exemption from one or more provisions of the CPA. The basis of such an application would be that those provisions overlap or duplicate a regulatory scheme administered by that regulatory authority. For example, the long and short term insurance industries have been exemption. The financial services sector and financial intermediaries sector have also been granted exemption. The airline industry has as well. The medical industry did not qualify for exemption as the relevant respective legislation governing these industries does not provide sufficient protection for consumers. Where the minister is satisfied that the regulatory scheme administered by the applicant achieves the purposes of the CPA, the minister may grant exemption from the application of the CPA. Such exemption may be limited and subject to certain conditions. However, even where the minister grants full exemption from the CPA, importers or producers, distributors and retailers of goods must still comply with the requirements of Section 60 and Section 61. Section 60 deals with the safety, monitoring and recall of goods that are found to be defective and hazardous. Where the Commission reasonably believes that goods are unsafe or hazardous and that the producer or importer has not take adequate measures to notify consumers of all the defect or to recall the goods, the Commission may give written notice to the producer calling on it to conduct an investigation into the nature causes, extent and degree of risk posted to the public. The Commission may also require the producer to carry out a recall program. Any producer or importer affected by such a notice may apply to the tribunal to have the notice set aside in its entirety or in part. Section 61 renders producers or importers, distributors or retailers of any goods liable for harm caused by the supply of unsafe goods product failure, defective or hazardous goods as well as where such harm is as the result of inadequate instructions or warnings being given to the consumer. This liability arises irrespective of whether the producer, importer, distributor or retailer acted negligently. Liability is therefore strict. The liability does not arise in the following instances. The hazard, failure or defect is wholly attributable to compliance with any public regulation. The hazard, defect or failure did not exist at the time the goods were supplied. Adequate instructions were given to the consumer and the consumer failed to comply with such instructions. Where it is unreasonable to expect the distributor or retailer to have known of the defect or hazard. 
The type of harm envisaged in the CPA is set out in section 61.5. In terms of this section, harm includes the death of or injury to any natural person, an illness of any natural person, any loss of or physical damage to any movable or immovable property, any economic loss that resulted from any harm. The CPA does not specifically state where a consumer may lodge a claim for damages for such harm. However, Section 61.6 refers the court's power to determine whether any harm claim has been proven, the court's power to access the extent of the harm and to apportion liability amongst persons to be found jointly and severely liable. It is therefore arguable that such a claim must be made to either the magistrate's court or to the high court. Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learnt in this lecture. Consumer Protection Act CPA is to address the grievances of the consumers and protecting them from the unethical practices or unfair trade practices of the manufacturer, supplier. Market resources and influences are growing by the day and so is the awareness of one's consumer rights. The Act provides for a three-tier quasi judicial redressal machinery at the district, state and national level to redressal of consumers' dispute and grievances. A consumer has the absolute right to buy any goods or services of his choice from among the different goods or services available in the market. The interests of the consumers are sought to be promoted and protected under the Act interalized by establishment of consumers' protection councils at the central and state levels.